Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Look at what my hair is doing. My goodness. And you know what? When you try and fix it in camera, it's always backwards. What do we need to do more camera angles from this side because when you do from this side, it shows exactly how big my forehead's getting. I like this better. Anyway, glad to see you guys. Um, I got a message the other day. I posted, I, I was asking you guys for some ideas, some content, things like that, as far as what we can cover in videos. And the question I got was from a registered nurse who has worked primarily um, like on, in an inpatient type of setting, not in a hospital or anything like that. I, I don't remember if it was hospice care or something along those lines. Anyway, the question that they presented to me was, what do I do if I roll up on scene of a motor vehicle accident? And that's actually a really good question for uh, a nurse who's, you know, maybe has training but doesn't have training in the streets. But it's also really good um, information for maybe some of the volunteer EMS agencies, volunteer uh, firefighters, things like that. I know, you know, myself that I've rolled up on quite a few traffic accidents and I've helped you know take care of patients on scene so I wanted to do a quick video real quick but I had to reference some material this is the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians Patient Assessment and Management for Trauma if you need a good reference as to how you should conduct yourself on scene of a traffic accident should you pull up on scene of one download this piece of paper it's a great refresher for you know those who may have forgotten it I'll be honest with you after a decade in the field I still when I have a patient medical or trauma I go through the entire uh, patient assessment in my head just to make sure that I didn't miss anything while conducting an assessment so you you have BSI scene safe Mechanism of injury, nature of illness, number of patients. We'll go through it kind of bullet by bullet. So first, obviously, takes or verbalizes appropriate PPE precautions. Determine as, if the scene is safe. This is really important. Uh, if the car's on fire, you know, don't get yourself blown up. Don't get yourself on fire, too, because then you're not going to be any use to the people who may need your assessment. Don't run. Watch for oil on the ground, watch for other fluids on the ground, things of that nature. You don't want to slip, you don't want to fall, you don't want to get hurt in the process. So determine if the scene is safe, size it up, figure out what's going on. Look at the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. Now, if you pull up, I have something on my nose, I can see it. And I'm not sure, it might be hanging off my glasses. Anyway, if the scene is... Uh, or, or mechanism of injury, nature of illness, really important to remember because the car accident may have been caused from a medical condition. So I'll give you a for example. I had a, a guy one time ran into a house, and when we got there, he was unresponsive, pulseless, apneic. It did not look to me like the accident was substantial enough to cause him to be in cardiac arrest. I suspected that a medical condition caused the accident. As it turns out, he'd had an aneurysm. Um, and there was actually no damage to the structure whatsoever. So pay attention. There's also the chance that the person who has had an accident uh, could be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. You've got the opportunity um, for a patient to have had a seizure. It's also entirely possible they've had some sort of diabetic emergency. Always keep that in mind when you pull up and you're initially assessing the scene. Uh, look around, see if anybody's called 911. If nobody has called 911 yet, get on the phone, go ahead and activate the emergency alert system so that you can have the ambulance, fire department, law enforcement respond appropriately. At this point in time, the scene's still really not safe because your vehicle is somewhere in the scene and there's no um, fire truck or law enforcement officer there to help block traffic and, and keep you all safe as you render aid. Consider stabilization of the spine. I like the fact that it says consider stabilization of the spine. If they're showing neurological deficits, if they're complaining of uh, neck pain, back pain, that sort of stuff, considering stab stabilization of the spine is absolutely imperative. I don't like where it falls in the survey though because it falls above airway. Here's the problem. 
if they're not breathing a stable airway does a stable C spine that's no good. So if you've got someone who's in the car unconscious not breathing, don't sit there and hold C spine. They're not going to live without you taking the appropriate measures for the airway. Doesn't work like that. I really think consider C spine should be further down in the list, but that's where it falls. Oh, he's not breathing. Yeah, but we got really good C-spine going on, bro. Anyway, consider stabilization of the spine. If they're conscious, alert, oriented, and complaining of neck pain, go ahead, take manual C-spine precautions, hold it until the paramedics arrive, and let them determine whether or not they're going to C-spine back for the patient, all that. Determine the level of responsiveness. Hey, hey, are you okay? Uh, you can apply painful stimuli to see if they'll respond to that. Uh, usually an inner thigh pinch, um, you know, pinch the inside of their arm press on their nail beds with your fingernail, that type of thing. See if maybe you can get some response that way. If they're not responding, you, you need to really pay attention to the airway, make sure that they're breathing, make sure that they haven't vomited into the airway, and move forward from there. So you open and assess the airway. You insert an airway adjunct as needed. If you don't have an airway adjunct with you, you're going to want to do either a modified jaw thrust, head tilt, chin lift if, if you don't suspect any uh, spinal injuries. Uh, assess their breathing, assess for adequate ventilation, um, check their pulse, carotid pulse is right up here, you've also got the radial pulse right here by your thumb, remember your thumb radiates from your hand so you've got a radial pulse there, you can assess the pulse, uh, you can count the number of respirations, you can determine whether or not the respirations are regular, whether they're irregular, whether they're normal depth, whether they're shallow, you can determine whether or not they're labored, look for uh, subclavian retractions, substernal retractions, belly breathing, that type of thing. Uh, when you're checking the pulse, you want to determine whether or not their skin is clammy, determine whether or not their skin is cold, is it warm, is it dry, is it pink. Um, and then we get down to assess for bleeding. Um, we're not worried about scrapes at this point in time. What we're worried about is major bleeding. We're worried about severe venous bleeding, major arterial bleeding. If there's any indication for a tourniquet, you might want to go ahead and apply a tourniquet at this point in time to stabilize them. Um, you know, if you don't have a, um, a cat tourniquet with you, you can improvise. You can use a t-shirt or something along those lines, maybe a belt. You don't want to use anything um, fine. You don't want to use like a wire or a twine or something like that that will actually cut into their skin. Whatever you know you used as a tourniquet, you would want it to be wide. Um, you know, the hope is that you slow the bleeding down and that we're actually able to preserve the arm. We don't want to, you know, apply a tourniquet prematurely and cut circulation off. If you don't have training in tourniquet application, just Hold direct pressure the best you can. Control the bleeding as best you can until people who have been adequately trained get there. Side note, this video is intended for people who have been trained in this. So if, if you're watching for the first time and you're thinking, oh, wow, I could do that. No, don't do that. There are procedures that need to happen when you're applying a tourniquet. There are ways that they need to be applied. There are proper and improper ways. And if you haven't been adequately trained, you can actually do more harm than good. Then you want to go ahead and start doing your history taking, find out what happened, uh, do your sample history, signs and symptoms, allergies, um, medications, past history, past medical history, last oral intake, the events that led up to the event. Uh, some car accidents are going to be very cut and dry. Look, I swear I hit this tree. Other car accidents, especially if there's any type of medical thing going on, may not be as clear. Uh, could be an Alzheimer's patient. You've seen silver alerts. They hop in their car, take off to go to the, the store down the corner. They wind up in friggin' Hawaii somewhere. Um, it happens. So in the event that you uh, think that there may be a medical cause to what's going on, you're also going to want to uh, obtain your OPQRST, the onset. Does anything make it better or worse? Um, uh, is there any pain? What type of pain is it? Does that pain radiate? Um, that that could be very important in a uh, patient that you actually suspect maybe a medical condition. Then you want to go down and you want to look at the head, the neck, the chest, the abdomen, the lower extremities, the pelvis, the uh, the back if you're able to assess the back. And this is basically all you can do on scene. If you've got a jump bag, 
uh, in the back of your car and you have some 4x4s, some gauze, some sterile water, sterile saline, things like that, you may be able to start bandaging some injuries. If you've got a, a splint, uh, you might be able to splint any broken bones. If you have any, um, oh, what was I going to say? I don't remember. Um, you know, you can do some basic first aid. You know, and, and again, with splinting and things of that nature, if you don't know how to do it properly, don't do it because, again, you can cause more harm than good. The thing is, if you do not have your equipment with you, if you're a nurse and you don't, you're not in the ER, there's only a limited amount of things that you can do. If you're a paramedic and you're not on your ambulance, there's only a limited amount of things that you can do. The number one thing, as soon as you identify that there's an accident, number one, make sure that you're safe, don't get yourself hurt. Number two, make sure that it, the, the paramedics are on the way. Make sure that uh, you've got the fire department, law enforcement on the way to help stabilize the scene. Then keep yourself safe. You know, don't don't go getting into a, a car that's on its side, you know, halfway in a ditch, and and wind up with a car rolled over on top of you. You know, the goal is that you are there to help, not to become part of the scene. After that, it's going to be basic assessments. Um, you know, assess their breathing, assess their pulse assess their level of consciousness, uh, and, and gather as much information as you can prior to the EMS agency showing up. The more information you're able to provide to them when they show up, the faster they're going to be able to perform their duties on scene. Again, C manual C-spine is fantastic. If there's a, you know indication for it, if mechanism suggested, if the patient's com complaint suggested, any evidence of paralysis, numbness, tingling, neck pain, back pain, get the manual C-spine. And you can obtain a lot of this history just sitting there talking to the patient. You want to rule out the major life threats first. Obviously, control the major bleeding. Um, help provide ventilations if you've got a pocket mask or something like that with you, and you've got to do that. But really, you're kind of limited as to what you can do. Um, but whatever you do, be safe. Do the right thing. Understand Good Samaritan laws do protect you. However, you cannot practice even within your scope of care if you're not functioning under the auspices of proper medical direction. So whatever you do, don't put your license in jeopardy by starting IVs and intubating people out of a jump bag full of equipment you've stolen from your department. That's a good way to get your license yanked and to get yourself in trouble. Anyway, I hope this has been useful. I hope it's been helpful. Y'all have a wonderful day. And if it's been noisy, it's because the theater department's right over there and they're practicing and dancing and, and they're a little dramatic. God bless you guys. Have a great day.